my name is Brandy Flores. I'm the Chief Development Officer with NAMI San Antonio, and I will be your workshop moderator. Before we get started, we have a few housekeeping items. If you are attending the conference to receive CEUs, please listen carefully. All registered attendees seeking CEUs must remain in the session for the entire duration. You must have signed in with the proctor. Proctor, please raise your hand. You must obtain an evaluation form from the proctor prior to the start of this session. At the end of the session, you will need to check back in with the proctor to turn in your completed evaluation to receive your certificate. Each workshop session is approximately 75 minutes long. You will receive 1.25 CEUs for this session. These are issued to LPC, LMFT, social workers, and psychologists. Each attendee can qualify for a total of 3.75 CEUs today for attending three workshops. We are grateful to have the support of NAMI Texas and the Bear County Recast Project for making these CEUs, CEUs available. Again, all registered attendees seeking CEUs must remain in the session for the entire duration upon completion of your return of your return to complete the evaluation form. You will receive your certificate. And now, it's my pleasure to introduce our speakers. And we have three of them, so I will now read each of their bios. So bear with me because I want to make sure that everybody gets the recognition that they deserve. And we will start with Noah Hagenau. He is a certified mental health care specialist. He is the director of the Peer Recovery Service Unit at Texas Health and Human Service Commission, HHSC. The unit oversees peer and recovery service delivery programs, supports, and peer work, workforce and acts as a consultant entity to agencies and organizations across the state and nation. Noah is a subject matter expert on recovery-oriented care, peer specialist integration, and peer-centered care. He has provided training and consultation at the local, national, and international levels. Prior to working for HHSC, Noah served as director of peer support service for Blue Bonnet Trails, a community service provider for eight central Texas counties. He also worked as a peer specialist at Austin State Hospital for five years, ultimately serving as a peer support discipline director for the Texas State Hospital Service. Noah helped lead the advocacy effort to create a peer support Medicaid benefit during the 85th legislative se session. And then it has in parentheses, so I'm going to read it out, TXHB1486. He served as the presiding officer for the stakeholder work group that assigned that creation of the benefit. Noah currently lives in Austin, Texas with his dog Hazel. They love to cook watch scary movies, and explore everything that the city has to offer. She is a mental peer specialist and national certified peer specialist. 
has worked in the mental health field for 37 years as a house parent crisis intervention team captain, emergency room psychiatrist assessor, psychotherapist advocate, peer support specialist, peer support specialist trainer, and peer support specialist supervisor. Most importantly, she uses her ongoing recovery from lived experience of mental health concerns to impact community systems and policy. She is the co-founder of Prosumers International and serves as executive director. Prosumers International is a peer-run, peer-driven service provider dedicated to providing people in their recovery journey. Prosumers are proactive in their recovery and provide back, and provide back to their community. She currently co-owns Pro International, a consulting organization that specializes in, in integrating mental health recovery and peer program. Pro International also provides training, coaching, and professional development services for peers, especially with the flagship program, Focus for Life. Dr. Gray currently serves on the Texas Behavioral Health Advisory Committee and several subcommittees, and she serves on the Texas Joint Committee on access and forensic services. She represents the voice of lived experience on the County Council for Disability Rights Texas and served on the board of the World Federation for Mental Health. Recovering resilience and thriving, Dr. Gray stands for all people who have lived experience and full lives. Let's give it up for the moderator too. Yes. Thank you. Yes. Awesome, y'all. It's. Can y'all hear me in the back? Everybody, thumbs up. Okay. Yes. One of my things I'm trying to work on is being more comfortable on a microphone. It's. I feel like my voice is loud enough that I don't need one, but then you have to use one. And, uh... Anyway, welcome. Um, this is. It's interesting. This is my first like in-person presentation since since COVID started. I've had more in-person events that I'm attending. But it's the first time I'm not you know, presenting from my living room with my dog Hazel, like right there, in uh, over two years. So very excited to be here. Um, as we get started, what we're going to be talking about today, it's uh, the, the title's you know, peer leadership, the importance of peer leadership. Um, so like, first of all, I wanted to just talk about who we were, aside from any, you know, any relationship to peer support or recovery or any of the other stuff, I think it's important first to be a person before we get into all of those other things. So um, I just wanted to hand it over to my esteemed co-presenters and ask that question. Like, like we'll start with with uh, Dr. Gray here. Anna, like, who are you? Thank you, Noah. Um, Appreciate it. So, um, I really appreciate being called doctor, but I never quite finished the doctor. So, um, I am Anna, for for all intents and purposes. And it is such an honor and pleasure to be here with you. And I, um, I actually grew up in Mexico. I am the daughter of missionaries, and I came to the states when I was 19 years old. Um, and I am, I found my passion to be, um, well, talking. Um, <laughs> my co presenters will get a kick out of that. But actually being able to, to be with people and talk about what, um, what lights people up. And so I, went about getting an education and being able to do that and I have dedicated my life to just enjoying people and learning how to thrive and learning how to live life. I um, have, I also have a pup, Charlie. Charlie is 84 pounds of baby. He's a German Shepherd that uh, his whole purpose for being on the planet is to be loved and petted and uh, played with, and that is his calling in life, and he's very good at it. Um, and so that's just a little bit about me. I, um, 
am excited to, to be here and have this conversation about peer leadership and really talking about what does that mean in the context of community. So thank y'all so much for being able to be here. Hi everyone, I'm Jesse. I uh, am also really excited and glad to be here. I am currently 27, but I'm about to turn 28. Hey! <laughs> I'm very excited about this. Um, I even take a whole day off of work. What is that? Uh, I am a parent. I have a seven-year-old child. I am uh, someone who really likes board games and trivia night. And D&D uh, &D is new to me, but I am very much enjoying it. I uh, also play video games in addition to the board games and stuff. I very much enjoy the connection piece, though. So one of the things I enjoy most in the world is connecting, like truly connecting with another person. And I guess it kind of like lends to our career as well. Um, <laughs> but really being able to just sit down and have conversations with somebody and learning who they are and you know what, what about them makes them them is one of my favorite things ever. Um, and really just connecting authentically. So whether that's through a board game or uh, video games or whatever it is, I just want to be able to have those conversations with people about what they are. Um, and let's see, what else? I do not have a dog. I have two cats. Um, and I am the emotional support human for one of them. Um, she's probably freaking out that I'm not at home because I also usually work from home. But I'm really excited to be here. And Noah, will you tell us who you are? Yeah, right on. Yeah, uh, yeah so I'm listening to a bio, that's always been uncomfortable, like hearing yourself introduced like that. Somebody gave me advice recently that just like bask in the discomfort, like it's cool that, those are cool things that it, I did apparently, you know? Um, <laughs> But I do, I get a little uncomfortable hearing that kind of stuff. I think I'm naturally kind of an introvert in my in my like real life. At work I play not an introvert, but, you know, so I can do that role uh, in my nine to five job. But then, you know, I like, I like going home, I like being in my house, I like listening to podcasts and walking around um, my neighborhood. I grew up in Austin. Um, my family ran a restaurant there. Uh, I used to drive to San Antonio every week to deliver, uh, we made hummus and tabbouleh to deliver hummus to Whole Foods and Central Market um, and Sun Harvest. So, uh, what was it, like the bun and barrel, there's like a burger over there that like, I always made a point of stopping and eating there. Um, but you know, Central Texas is just part of, it's, it's the core of my life this has been spent here. I also spent a little time in Mexico, though I wasn't born there. I spent a year in, in uh, Central, what was it, Cuernavaca. Uh, the year after I graduated high school, and I consider that a foundational experience and understanding how family works there, what the, the culture looks like, um, and in understanding myself in a different way. Uh, but I feel like I, I really enjoy history, I enjoy reading, um, I, I, like, I like understanding stuff, um, and I'm, I'm somebody that questions, I, I question things a lot. Like you're presenting it this way, is it really that way? Should it be that way? And those are things that really have lent themselves to my current career path. Very good. Thank you so much, Mark. And you know, hopefully most of y'all had an opportunity to be in the presentations this morning. Um, and there were some messages that were pretty loud and clear. Um, one was, we need to start talking about this thing called recovery. And two is, what does that mean? What is it gonna take? And one of the things that was mentioned in passing was the idea of peer support. And you have here some of the preeminent leaders in peer support in Texas and nationally. Um, and so, we would like to talk to you about why peer support, why does it matter, and why does it matter in community? And specifically here in San Antonio, why does it matter in the communities that have been marginalized, whose voice has not been heard? 
So that's kind of the direction we're going to be taking. Um, what does it mean to be a peer leader, a peer support leader? As you listen to, to Noah and Jesse, and uh, I'll put my two cents in, it's been a going joke that you can't get, keep me from talking anyway, so <clears throat> they decided I could be the moderator. That way they get to talk because I turned them the mic. Um, one of the things, though, that, that we want, we want this to really be of use to you and what matters to you and what's important to you. So, um, if you haven't noticed by now, one, we know each other fairly well and we tend to be fairly informal in the way we present. At some point I will probably stand up because it's hard for me to often stay seated at the same time. Um, and we want, this is informal. This is for you. This is, you know, we're not just talking heads. This is about what really matters to you and what's going to make a difference in the areas you want to make a difference in. So we encourage you to ask questions. We may ask you questions. Uh, we want it to be interactive. It's a conversation. Um, but in the meantime, we're going to kind of give you a jumping off point. And one of the things that has happened fairly recently, and I'm going to let Noah talk about this, is the recognition of peer support as a profession at, at the state level and the importance of it that has risen to the level of actually having an office at the state level for that purpose. And so, Noah, can you kind of share with us a little bit about, one, the development of the um, now Office of <coughs> Support, and the why you see that as being important or significant in terms of where we're going in the area of mental health, substance use, yeah. and here's well, I, thank you so much, Anna. And I think, you know, you can't start talking about where we are today without talking about where we've come from, right? And so, you know, I personally, when I got involved in 2011, um, what, what peer support, the peer support landscape in Texas, first of all, the term recovery, I, you know, I identify as having mental health and so it's all intertwined, right? Um, that was a term that I associated only with substance use. There, you know, I, I didn't even think of the concept of recovery. I, I didn't see how that, I didn't understand how that applied to mental health until I came in as a volunteer um, and heard about peer support for the first time. So I think that's the first thing is like the concept of like putting a recovery construct, construct with something foreign to me. I'd never heard of that. Um, the other was beginning to understand how peer support had started here in Texas. That, you know, it goes back very far. It's a concept as old as humanity, right? Like, if you're struggling with something or you're about to go through something, talking to somebody else that's been through it, that, like, when I took the job at HHSC, I had a friend that worked there. I was like, hey, let's go to lunch. Like, tell me what it's really like there. Do you, do you enjoy it? What's the culture like? The same if you, you know, have a, a death in your family and you have a friend that's gone through the same type of thing. Or, you know, you break your arm and you talk to your friend that was like, Oh, I had to cast on a cut like six months ago. Here's the type of bag you put over it. Here's how you scratch your arm. You know, like those very practical things, I think, are um, something that's just as old as humanity. I think in the context of behavioral health, if you think of the, like, inherently when a person encounters, it's like when, when you either seek out services or the services seek you out, right? Like, um, by definition, you're just not in your most organized place. And the people that you're talking to often, when they're the clinical folks that you're talking to, they they present very professional, and it feels like there's a bit of a, a power imbalance between you and what you want, and then this expert that's there to help you. So I think the idea of having a role inside of behavioral health, which mental health and substance use, that's coming from that more personal place, that like, hey, I'm somebody that's been through stuff like this, and I'm just here to walk alongside you and debrief with you after the doctor walks out of the room, try to make sure that you're understanding what's going on, that we're communicating those things over to your providers, whoever they are, if, you know, like, those are not easy things to do in our system, and they're just not easy to do at all. They're things I still struggle with. I, I know recently I got a new dentist, I got flipped upside down, I had all these questions that I was gonna ask. And, you know, she was in a hurry. I felt bad asking. 
and I didn't bring any of my questions up, you know? And it's, I just think that, that it's not an easy thing to do, and, and it's so important. So that's like what role we play in our system in a very kind of miniature way of describing it. Um, I think the system has recognized that this is important since probably the early 2000s, I think was when we officially started to get like looked at a little bit. It wasn't until around 2007 that the federal folks were like, they made an official declaration that states could recognize peer support. And that was the impetus to begin creating peer support certifications and definitions. But the people making all of the decisions about how that worked had really no expertise on what it was. Um, and so what we saw over the next 10 years, really, was you know, the peer support community beginning to be present in different places. That's, you know, I came in as a volunteer. You know, really, I've been struggling a lot for about a decade, and I just, you know, wanted to get back in some kind of a way while I was figuring out my next step. I'd been on, at that point, I was on, you know, social security disability, had been told I wouldn't work again, probably wouldn't, you know, live outside of an unsupervised setting. And so when things started to get better through my own recovery path, like, I looked around and I noticed, like, hey, during the day, everybody else goes and does something, you know, and I, I only had worked in you know, restaurants and stuff like that, so that's what I thought I was going to do. And I just thought, well, I could volunteer in the meantime, and that's what led me to the state hospital, and somebody said, here's this thing called peer support, and it blew my mind. I was like, you know, in an interview with somebody talking about all of the things I would never want an employer to know, that, you know, I'd been hospitalized before, the, the, the issues that I'd have with substance use, the challenges with all like defining who I was and moving forward in my life. And, you know, I, I found out all the components of what it was. And for me personally, I was just like, this was, I was made to do this work, you know, to talk with other people and try to have, help them not struggle how I did. Because I struggled alone. And that was kind of the main thing, was I was isolated and I was alone in my struggle. And I thought there was nobody that could understand that, and that I was a broken person. My brain was broken, and I was going to be incapable of having any kind of a life because of how sick I was. Um, so that thought of being able to try to help people know that they can do this thing, like they can still, in spite of whatever challenges we face, you can still achieve these things that you want to do in your life, that drove me. And what we've seen in the last you know, since 2011, you know, like, we've advocated, we've come together as a workforce to say we need to define what peer support looks like. The way that these other folks have done it isn't right. You know, we need to define it in a way that is appropriate. And so working with people like uh, Anna and having leaders like Jesse around, it helped us come together as a community and pass legislation at the Capitol, something I never thought I would have anything to do with, you know? And then, you know, now we're at the point where through that legislation, I think it was Anna that mandated that we needed to be a part of defining what, what is peer support? What does the supervision look like? Where can they work? All those things needed to be done with a work group, um, which was a new thing. The state of Texas doesn't often work super transparently. I don't know if folks have a lot of experience with working with giant bureaucracies, but it's confusing, and generally decisions are made behind closed doors. So this was a new way of doing business, so to speak. And so I was a part of that work group, and through that process, and this was in 2017 and 18, they decided that they needed to open a statewide office that would oversee uh, developing these services so that they were present across the state of Texas. And uh, I was fortunate to begin as the director of the Peer Services Unit in 2019. And what we've seen on a state that that higher level of you know the bureaucracy and you know where stuff gets funding and defining different things and rules, um, our our area has grown significantly, and we're seeing ourselves again take more steps forward. So, you know, what, I think what we see in general is a system that. It needs some help, you know? It needs more voices like all of ours involved in designing it because it doesn't reach all the people that it should and it doesn't, it's not getting us the results that we all need in our lives. 
And so having more people involved in that planning process is going to be essential to meeting the need that exists. And I didn't do that. There you go. Thank you, Noah. And so you can begin to hear that there is a recognition that the idea of people who've experienced what it is to have uh, unseen stimuli or hearing things people don't, don't other people don't hear or feeling paralyzed and not able to get out of your bed even when there's nothing physically keeping you in that bed. We've experienced that. We've walked through those hallways and knowing that makes a difference when encountering people who are just beginning to acknowledge something you know, I, my, my thought process is my behavior are such that I'm not fitting in my world very well. And um, so realizing the, the impact and the value of having somebody walk with you in what can be a very frightening experience in your life can make a big difference. And that recognition has led to um, the development of certified peer specialists, so there's actually training that we go through to get certification, and now the acknowledgement from the state of Texas that this is important enough to actually fund um, a whole unit that, and now an office, that addresses these issues and ensures that we maintain the, what I call the magic of peer support as we work with the systems that exist to make a difference for people's lives. And this movement, if you will, has grown significantly. And one of the organizations that has made a big difference for that and keeping, beginning to really put at the forefront the idea of peer support as an integral part of what it is to treat behavioral health issues, mental health issues, substance use issues, uh, has been the National Association for Peer Supporters. Um, and it has been integral in actually creating uh, the standards and, and the values and the approaches that we take in the work we do. And so if it, if it works for you, Jesse, I was gonna ask you, we're, we're passing around, the, this is a QR code. If you have a smartphone and you point it at that, it will point you to a um, document on the web of our practice guidelines that were developed by the National Association of Peer Support. So I'm going to turn it over to you. I'll just take this one. Uh, so thank you for passing that out. The QR code, if you can't get it to work, you can also find the document at peersupportworks.org under the resources tab. Uh, we just thought we'd give you a quick uh, way to grab it if that works for you. Uh, the national practice guidelines were developed by, I believe, over a thousand peer supporters working together to get consensus on what peer support really is and uh, the values behind why we, what we do and the why of what we do what we do, how we do what we do. Well, it's so hard, y'all. Um, <laughs> but uh, these national practice guidelines, uh, on the link you'll see that there are two different versions. There's one national practice guidelines, and then there's the national practice guidelines for supervisors. And while these are developed for use by peer supporters and by peer supervisors, it is also applicable for anybody looking to implement peer support into your organization, into your community, into your um, efforts to be able to look at these and see where can I support peer support coming into our efforts in a truly um, accurate way or one that holds fidelity to what peer support specialists really do. Uh, one of the challenges that we have as a profession is when we get introduced to an organization or an effort or a community for the first time, a lot of times people don't know what we do when we start our position. So we're constantly sharing and starting from scratch of this is my job, this is not my job, this is my job, this is not my job. Um, and when I was working as a peer supporter for a outpatient doctor's office, I was asked to write the letters to uh, patients of the doctor that was, or one of the doctors that was working there, uh, that he was no longer willing to work with. 
and I was a peer supporter and I was supposed to be working with these people mutually and helping them reach their goals and advocating with them in their doctor's office. And the, you know, this was such a completely separated idea of what I do from what they're asking me to do. Um, that you know, it's it's a challenge and it's pervasive. Um, so one of my one of my asks that y'all take from this is uh, you know learning about what peer support truly is when you're looking to implement it. If you're looking to implement it in your organization and community, and these natural practice guidelines are hopefully going to help you uh, with that. Is that what you meant? Whatever else you want to say. Okay. So, um, as predicted, I'm mentioned. There we go. Here we go. There it is. <laughs> um, I, and I appreciate that, uh, definitely, Jesse. And one of the things that we're really fortunate about is, yes? Can we get the, can we get the, uh, the QR code? Yes, please. There's several copies. Y'all can just keep passing them around as you need to. Um, the One of the things also that I want y'all to know about is that we're extremely lucky in that, uh, or fortunate here in Texas, in that Jesse actually is in Texas and is the president of the National Association of Peer Supporters. So uh, that's just, thank you. And, and she, uh, she's done a great job. That's her team. side job, by the way. Yeah, that's her she, side yeah. job. Uh, she does that for free on the side. Uh, which, is, which is a component of peer support. We're talking about peer support leadership. One of the things that about peer support leadership is that mostly that's the side job. Um, as we have developed more our, our training, our professionalism, our ability to um, have our voice be heard more and more. There are paid positions, which is what uh, Noah is doing a lot of work to increase the workforce and peer support. And there's a couple of things, you know, this being a faith-based conference, one of the things that I can say here is being a peer provider is a lot like being Paul. You know, Paul said he can be all things to all people. Being a peer supporter is being able to be what is needed for a person who is either hurting or first discovering their own challenges, or in fact is beginning to realize they can thrive in life, which is just as scary as realizing that you're not doing well, in case you hadn't, weren't aware of that, right? And so we get to be there in those times and walk with people in those uh, challenges, the challenges of success and the challenges of not doing so well. And for, for us to be able to do that, it requires us having walked that journey. It requires us getting to a point of recognizing the challenges we have in living life and finding what's going to help us either live with it, get through it, get over it, get under it, and get on with life. Recovery is possible. The word recovery is inadequate because for many of us there's nothing back there to pick up and recover, right? It's discovery. The discovery of how to live life powerfully with anything we're dealing with. One of the things that, and so here locally we have the prosumer group. Prosumers actually was born and raised in Texas. We are a peer-run, peer-governed, peer-operated service provider program. Janet Paleo is the um, inspiration for it. She and I are the co-founders of it. And when Noah was talking about when peer support got started in Texas, one of the very first peer support positions was at the Center for Healthcare Services. Uh, in 2002, Janet was one of three people in the state of Texas who had positions that they had gotten because of their own lived experience. And so we've, we've grown significantly since then. And where we are today, and where the leadership part comes in, and please jump in, and if y'all have questions, ask them, is healing happens in relationships, and relationships happen in community. Right? 
we get hurt in relationships, which makes it hard for us to reach out and be in healthy relationships with people. And yet that's where healing happens. You heard in the um, presentation that was done this morning uh, of a, an amazing recovery story that somebody reaching out and saying, what do you enjoy in life? Making the absolute difference for, for um, the young lady who was speaking. And sometimes just somebody walking up and seeing me, not me, the one who hid out in college. My, my story is very similar to hers. I started college at Texas State University and I was on the dean's list the very first semester I was in school. I took 15 credit hours, that's three more than you have to take to be full time. I was the overachiever. I was mad because I made one B, I made all A's on everything else. My second semester, I took 15 hours. I made one D and four F's. I couldn't get out of bed. Things were happening in my environment that other people didn't see. There was no one there to see me. And I'll tell you what, as the daughter of a missionary, the missionary's daughter, when I reached out to a faith-based community, I couldn't let them know I was hurting. I was supposed to be a leader in that community. I couldn't let them know what was going on. When I didn't show up for things, it was, oh, I was busy or I was studying. Not, I was in bed and couldn't get out of bed and get down the hall to the bathroom. Because it wasn't okay. The power of peer support is letting that be okay. Not something that needs to be fixed. Not something that needs to be changed. But something we can provide space for. So that you stop beating up on yourself for being in that space. Long enough to know that there may be an, another way of doing things. That's the power of peer support. And in our communities, our communities of faith, we need that openness, that non-judgmental approach. We need to know it's okay to fail, it's okay to stink, it's okay not to look good, it's okay to drool, and it's okay to say, I don't know why I'm doing all of this, come help me. We need spaces where it's okay to do that. We need spaces where it's okay to say, I drank too much yesterday and I can't function today. Or I'm joking because I don't have a fix, can you help me? We need spaces where it's okay to say those things and not immediately get dealt with like there's something wrong with us. Learning how to understand how pain gets communicated, the language of pain. The language of pain looks a lot like using substances. The language of pain looks a lot like I'm cutting on myself because I need to have something to show for the pain that you can't see. The language of pain is, I'm saving all my pills because day after tomorrow I have my plans. I don't want them on the planet anymore. That's the language of pain. If I'm actually saying that to you or letting you know that, consider that if I really want that to happen in two days, I wouldn't be telling you. I wouldn't let you know that. In my experience, people who want to die, die. People who are at the end of their rope and don't know what else to do, talk about it. So that you can say, okay, let's talk. I get it. I don't know exactly what you're going through. I don't know what has brought on the pain, but what happened? What happened to God in this room? Not what's wrong with you. Not, oh, you're crazy, let's call the police. But what happened? What got you here? That's the language of pain. Many of us go through what we go through because of history and trauma. We've got to be able to express that pain in our communities without being ostracized for having done so. Because many times we don't have the words to say, this is how bad it hurts. The same way I didn't have the words to get in my faith community and say, I can't get out of bed. because I don't know why I'm paralyzed. I was 19 years old when I came to the United States. 
I don't exactly look Mexican. Or at least that's what I'm told. <laughs> my first language was Spanish. My culture was that of Mexico City, a city of 20 million people at the time. Lubbock, Texas was not anything like that. I had lots of trouble eating when I got to the States. In Mexico, an early dinner is about 8 o'clock at night. The dorm cafeteria closed at 6. When I got hungry, it was closed. And I wanted to go out to eat. And this was back in the uh, late 70s, early 80s. They rolled up the sidewalks at 6. The only thing opened after that were the bars. Good Baptist girl was not going to go to the bars to eat. Can y'all see how there was a total disconnect from my environment and me? And no one to help me bridge that gap. So, in community, that made a difference. And the community I found was the community of people receiving services at what at the time was called Love of Regional and Major Mark. The people everybody else said were crazy. Because you know what? They didn't judge me. They didn't judge me. They talked to me. They talked to me about what they were going through. They let me talk about what I was going through. And together, at least we weren't so lonely. Eventually, I worked as a house parent at a halfway house. And I spent my weekends with 30 people who were either just coming out of Vicksburg State Hospital, which at that time, average hospitalization was 90 days. So you get out of the hospital and you lost housing, you lost all your belongings, you lost your job. If you had one, you lost everything. So you had to come back and start over. So they would stay at the halfway house. The other half of the people there were people who had been told they needed to be in the hospital and they were trying to do whatever they could to avoid that. And we talked. We visited. We shared about our dreams. We talked about jobs we did have. Lives that we thought we would never regain, but that were meaningful to us. About family, kids, hopes. And in sharing our hopes with each other, we gained hope. And they gave me my calling and meaning in life, which when you look at those P's, I got a purpose. And so, you know, it was hard for me to share a little bit about me when I don't share about that in work, because for me, this isn't work, it's my life. And it's hard not to talk about it. This is what I did. And they gave me my life back. Yes, sir? I'm curious about the name that you chose for the Prosumers. Pro is that a combination of two names or what does that mean? Um, so it is, it's a rebellious name. <laughs> um, when, we, when we named the organization, the word that we were called all the time was consumers. And as, as a movement, we don't particularly care for the word consumer because it implies that all we do is take, right? Actually, in Latin America and in Europe, we are called users. And that's what consumer meant for us. We use uh, other services. The term prosumers is a play on the idea that who we are are people who are proactive in their recovery and we provide back to our community. We are prosumers. We are here to serve and to ensure that our communities know we have a lot to offer. Um, and so that's, thank you for asking, because it was a very intentional choice for the, for the name. So anything y'all want to add? I've kind of been prattling on. I know thoughts have come up. Yes, sir. Time for you Yes. Just an idea. Uh, I'm not sure what my question is, but uh, I can become environment of families and parents uh, who have someone they love suffering with an illness. And often we see them retreating, uh, isolating before we realize that there's a problem. If we had 
knowing their suffering beforehand, then we might have gone to the doctor to get a shot to fix it all. But uh, we learn this after we're thrown into something like a crisis, which is what our health care handles. Our health care really only handles crisis. They don't handle uh, prevention. They don't offer prevention. And what I think that I'm reading and understanding is that pre prevention can be very important. And the more crises we're able to all avoid, the people, my children and myself, are better off. Uh, I'm, I'm, a little, I'm learning more about consumers. I'm so grateful for this concept. And I'm really rather surprised and mesmerized. I think I heard you say that you worked in a doctor's office or provider's office and that you reach out. I've never heard of that before. That there was actually someone who had a lived experience that was reaching out to people who could identify. So I'm happy to hear that. I've not experienced it uh, with my children, but I'm, I'm really happy to know that's happening. Um, and I'm not really sure where I'm going with this, Anna. I'm just really concerned. You know, I, I see that we've got so much has happened. I've observed this activity for the past 20 years as well, from the other side of the table, perhaps, and it's not happening fast enough for me. Yeah. You know, it's not broadcast. You know, I have 20 people, moms and dads and grandparents and aunts and uncles who come to my monthly family meetings and they're in turmoil you know, because the people they love are suffering and they want to help and they don't know what to do and so something isn't connecting. You know, I, I share about this uh, education that their loved ones can get. It seems like it's hard to find it. It's hard to get connected to it. Um, and while we, I try to encourage my peers, you know, other families, so go call for Zooms, you know, go to the clubhouse. But mom and dad telling their 35-year-old son, go, I heard down this place, go do this, it just doesn't work real easy. You know, because after you live with all this, no matter how good you think you are as a family, you're in conflict. And it doesn't matter how much you love your son or daughter, you're fighting. I mean, you just struggle day after day, year after year, and so it's hard for me to have much credibility to say, go to Clubhouse and you're going to feel better. And so this concept, you know, yeah. and I can I give you, you know, can I give you the name of my son who needs someone to reach out to him? And, and can someone go to him and, and start sharing? My wife experienced cancer this year. And before she ever had her surgery, she started receiving calls from other people who had already gone through the surgery and were already on chemo and all this stuff. She knew everything that was happening from personal experiences before her surgery day came. And yet, my children who deal with mental illness are still alone. Yeah, and I would, I would want to share that what you're describing, well, I mean, I'm, I'm probably projecting a little bit here, uh, but what you, what you were describing as people reaching out for uh, your life is something that I think is a goal for us here with your supporters. Me working in that position at a doctor's office was a very unique position, um, and it was, uh, specifically grant funded under a very specific grant and I can't even tell you what all the initials were uh, for it. Um, but I think that one of the really amazing things uh, that we as peer supporters can do is figure out how to get into positions like that and how to create programs that can reach out to people who are looking for support but also 
who can just be there so that when somebody goes to the doctor's office and has like, hey, I, I really think I'm dealing with a mental health thing, or I'm looking at like starting a mental health med or something like that, the doctor can say, you know what, I have somebody here who has gone through something similar and like they're on our staff and would love to talk to you. And having that right there to support them and uh, help them figure out what, what they want to do with their life and how they want to get better, if they want to get better, or if they just kind of want to be at the moment. You know, just having that creativity of people who have been through this in leadership positions to be able to create those programs is super important. I think that's one of the reasons why we're here in, you know, in this conversation with y'all, is we recognize that having peer supporters in leadership roles it can greatly impact the health and well-being of the community. And I would I would say that while we are all in positions of leadership across, across many different systems, that doesn't mean that we aren't still working at a community level. And you'll find most peer supporters are doing that. If you can advocate within your community, whether it's a church, whether it's a healthcare organization, whether it's an after school club for your kids, to start looking into this uh, thing called peer support specialists and seeing where you can start bringing them into the decision making process of what's going on and how we can support people. I think that that is going to make a huge impact in your community's well-being. Um, and I know Noah has things to say too. Sure. Um, I mean, I, so you're, you're asking the real question, I think. And, I mean, it's something that when I was earlier in my career, I think I might have been audacious enough to think I had an answer, you know? And I think the reality, there, there's two pieces here. One is I think we can all acknowledge we have a system that is inadequate, period. I think there's challenges around and this is from my own experience, I'll speak from an eye. For me, putting a medical label only on myself was a challenge, because I was looking for the modality, I was looking for the therapy, the pill, where's the thing that's gonna fix this? I was looking everywhere, and at some point I was like, I guess I'm either so broken or incapable that there's no point, you know, like I, and that was a belief system I took on. And coming into the kind of this, and accidentally coming into the peer support universe, I felt empowered for the first time. And it was like a light switch sort of thing, just seeing other people kind of in similar places that like, oh wait, I have a role in this? Like I'm supposed to be actively doing something too? And I think the reality now, where like after having enough experience, you know, having a friend that this morning called me from the Travis County Jail, you know, like a dear friend that I've tried to support and it's just in a struggle that you can't want it for somebody else. We can try to set conditions. We can try to give the tools. We can try to love. But I mean, at the end of the day, when I've had either family members or dear friends, I don't have a magic answer. And, and I don't think if anybody says they do, that's not true. And I think my personal belief is each one of us have to, I call it fight our dragons, and hopefully come out the other side and be able to, to move forward in their life. But I can't do that for anybody else. And I, you know, so that, that's the one hand. The other is through doing this work, I feel like we set up a system and we do something where we need to support these other suffering people, right? It's like, we're here, we're all well. All of us here, we're good, right? And we need to create a system for those other people that are having a hard time. And what I've learned in doing the work, at first I thought the peer specialists, we're the only ones, right? But what I've learned in, in each layer as I've gone into administration and with legislators and like in, in new levels is the people drawn to doing this work, we've all been touched, whether it's us personally or somebody we deeply care about. And what we need to do and what needs to change in my opinion is we need a system that works for all of us and acknowledges, and I think we're in a unique place because of COVID, and I think it's been very public that people struggle sometimes, that we need to be a society or a culture that's more comfortable talking about that. Because, you know, 
I remember in a hospital they had that thing where it was like, look at all of these uh, amazing, like Abraham Lincoln had major depression and you know, like Britney Spears, whatever. What I saw was like, man, I have depression and I'm in a hospital. That guy was running the country. And I, honestly, the thing that would have been more inspiring, go ahead. That made you feel better, didn't it? Oh, they fixed yeah. it. But I needed to hear that my mailman or my, you know, the, the person that like, I, that's the thing is the people in my community that they also have struggled. And that's what I found out is that that story is everywhere. We've all had struggles with things. We've all had to persevere. And those things that, that need to exist, having friends to talk to, a job that's important, you know, those things are universal. Those are the same things that I, I don't, you know, I dare say your children or the people that we would label with serious and persistent mental illness, those are the same things that help all of us, you know? And so I think those are things that hold other people where they feel they're different than and isolated from and incapable of doing things. But this is a, it's a big ask, you know? So it is. that's it, my soapbox. I, there's a couple of questions question. in the back. Yeah, great question. Yeah, and I'm gonna circle back. So that's so I'll keep it, I'll keep it short. So I have mental health and I've been on this journey for about 15 to 20 years. Back then there was nothing. I knocked on doors, nobody wanted to help me, my family didn't even know how to have a conversation, right? So I'm a peer specialist and now I have children in the twenties that are half mental health, right? So um, we get families that call me to know me. Hey, you know, can, can I get call you? Can we call you because I'm a parent and he doesn't share with me? So we'll take those calls, we'll navigate, and I've learned being a mommy that I need to approach it from a fear, right? Not so much from a mother week, because a lot of mother conversations that I have to come from myself, right? Like, yeah, I know there's not a lot out there, but let me share with you that we have more than I ever had 20 years ago, right? And I'll just end with this. So my kid's 23, and I've been trying to get him to express himself since he was seven, when we were going for a divorce and trauma and all these things, right? So from seven to 23. The nominee difference for me, my life changing moment for me, is as I learn how to hold this space. Like, from a parent, I want you to be able to talk to me. And he said, Mom, all these years you've been expressed, you've been asking me how to express myself, and I can't even, like, tell you. I said, okay, well, we can sit here, and we can just hold space. So it was like hours old, so we can share it. It was hours, and we were like, I have a visual for you as a mother. All these years, right, of doing the work and being, right, he tells me, I feel like I'm on a robot. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm rolling ahead, okay? But the wind is against me. I'm trying to be emotional, he said. The wind is against me, and I can't get any further. And I see all of my friends passing me by, and they're getting ahead, and they're getting mad, and they're having all these things, right? And how good it would feel just to let go. And I said, babe, all you need is for the wind to shift. And he said, how do I get the wind to shift, babe? And of course, I cried with you, but in the moment, I wouldn't be surprised, right? I said, babe, you just gotta get the radius. You just gotta be willing to do your work, right? But, excuse me, yeah, I just want to share with you that. A lot of families call me to come and they want to know, like, hey, why is it going to be called when I'm with my kid, right? The way we handle medical stuff. And I just want to say, as a mother, as a peer, as that a humble for him came with me saying, This is a safe space for you. If you don't know how to express, don't express yeah. yourself. And yeah. they do talk. Do you want to, are you renting or do you want feedback? And as a mother, when they give you that feedback, you want to say something? No, mom, I don't need you to say anything. Right. That is we, we don't need fixing, we're not broken. Yes. And we yes. get told we are. Yes, sir. Yes. At the end, when in mind, we suffers from severe depression. And I couldn't understand how she could get severe depression. I've never experienced it. And um, one day, uh, I saw her. And she looked like she was very kind of out of love. Out of touch with me. And, um, she was telling me that she was 
academy to the education. Mm -hmm. And it just broke my heart. And I didn't know what else to do. I was ashamed of her. I felt something. And um, I had no experience in how I was supposed to be in depression. Yeah. And uh, I was just wondering how I was talking about it. What do you say to somebody like that? So, and, and I appreciate the question. Um, I wish we had another couple of hours, right, to talk about this. So in the absence of knowing what to do, stop doing anything. Say, I don't know what to do, but I'm going to sit here with you. And whatever, whatever you need to be or do, it's okay, but you're not in it alone because I'm sitting in this space with you. You don't have to have answers. We don't have the answers. If we had the answers, we'd eradicate this thing and you wouldn't have a problem yet. <laughs> the, the answers are in the person's lives themselves. And the one thing I'll go back to what you were sharing. Um, if you have parents that are hurting so badly, I invite you to ask them to come to the listeners so they can learn to live their life in power. When our parents are empowered, we can be empowered. But when a parent is hurting because their child is hurting and they feel paralyzed themselves and helpless to make a difference, they are now in that same robot, as you so aptly said. And the parents and the child are rowing against gale force winds and wondering why one doesn't understand the other. It is a helpless feeling. It is disempowering. You are human beings as parents too, and it affects you. Everybody's welcome at prosumers. We don't ask anybody if they have a diagnosis. We had a gentleman who was a grandfather, and he wanted his grandson to come because his grandson was not doing well. And he finally figured out that if he came to prisoners and took home what he learned, that that made all the difference in the world. His grandson didn't have to come. He came for himself and he learned things. And he got to share that when he got home. So there aren't any quick fixes. This is a journey. We don't get where we are overnight. We're not going to get out of it overnight because one of the challenges of recovery is learning how to live life. We're not born, none of you in this room that I know of, and I could be wrong, was born with the perfect how-to manual strapped to your behind when you were born. You didn't pop out with the encyclopedia of living life. We're all learning one step at a time. Yes, my time is up. Know that there is hope. And it does take time and effort. Yes? What, what advice or suggestions would you get to church? Oh. That's a lot, and I, I can see our moderator's face of like, we are over time, but I do want to say that we will stick around for a few, so please, please don't think that we're... So we're not not answering your question. We just need to also let them set up for the next people. If you need to go, go, and we will stick around and let the our, our great hosts do what they need to do for the space.